Thank you for joining me for this expose of one of our most profound emotions. This model is the fruition of many years of dealing with very frustrated children, adolescents, adults, which is actually most of us much of the time. The story I'm about, I'm about to tell you is the ultimate result of looking at frustration through certain lenses. First of all, attachment. That human drive for togetherness uh, that is absolutely preeminent. An understanding of emotion, uh, including the purpose of emotion and how the brain actually works. An understanding of how potential unfolds quite spontaneously if conditions are conducive. The story is a huge story, an incredibly important story, a truly amazing story, providing an inside glimpse of nature's brilliance in taking care of us. Now, the complete story of frustration would take volumes. I, do, I don't have the time to write it, and undoubtedly, you wouldn't have the time to read it. So I'm going to try to tell it to you in a digest form, uh, with the hope that uh, in this digest, or I should I say digestible form, it doesn't lose any of the salient elements. It is through these lenses that I have come to know frustration intimately and in so doing come to appreciate it immensely. And I would like to reintroduce frustration to you through these lenses. Not that any of you need an introduction to frustration, but to introduce it to you uh, through these lenses. I'm going to personalize it a bit because frustration has quite a life of its own. It, in fact, when I first started putting the pieces together, I did it under the title, The Life and Death of Frustration, and then The Life Cycle of Frustration. Now, we'll start with the fact that frustration, as far as I'm concerned, is one of the unsung heroes of the emotional brain, of the whole brain, really, whose work is often camouflaged and reputation tainted or sullied by some of its more undesirable derivatives, or to keep it in line with the personalization, offspring. Uh, I bring a few of them to the fore here that really uh, hide frustration that is underneath. Tantrums, we could add tirades, suicidal impulses, guilt, uh, frustration-based de uh, depression, obsessive self-improvement. Uh, we could add compulsive problem-solving, anger, violence, aggression, self-attack, and so on. So I've alluded to the fact that frustration has work to do. Indeed it does. In fact, it is a first responder, uh, also called a primal emotion, uh, to incoming input. It sits just inside the sensory gate to the brain uh, to scan for, uh, for any, uh, uh, any indication that something is not working. In fact, that's the best working definition of frustration. It works hard to signal the rest of the brain and pushes forcefully for change. Now, emotion means e-motion, to move, uh, and frustration certainly does that. Uh, it, it does it uh, powerfully, forcefully, and it does it pretty well unseen, that is, outside of our awareness. We don't even have to be conscious of what it's doing. In fact, most of the time, we're not conscious of it at all. But what is really significant here is that frustration, like all primal emotion, is blind in itself. It's just giving a signal that something is not working. Uh, the insight about what isn't working and when it wasn't working and and uh, uh, the details uh, linking uh, linking all of the information around it is dependent upon feelings. And so it's blind itself with added insight dependent, dependent upon being adequately felt. More on this a bit later. Lastly but not least, frustration can have multiple outcomes depending upon the situation and the circumstances, hence the analogy of the traffic circle. So frustration can have multiple outcomes, in this case, three possible outcomes. Uh, in, in this case, the traffic is going to go to the right. 
Uh, now, the first outcome, um, as I've already stated, uh, its job, its primary purpose is to effect change. Now, there'd be no reason for change if we were satisfied uh, with the status quo. Frustration provides notice to the problem-solving brain that something isn't working. It also provides a motivation uh, to effect change of some kind in the hopes, of course, that if change happens, it will somehow fix the problem. Now, if it does, the story of frustration comes to an abrupt and successful end. The work is done. The problem is, of course, there are so many things that we are up against that cannot be changed. Holding on to good experiences, altering time, changing the past, other people's decisions, getting one's way all the time, holding close those we are attached to, bridging death, and so on and so on. The good news is that there is an inbuilt program in the brain for this. If up against futility, then it is us that needs to be changed. And so it is the story of adaptation. Changed from inside out, deeply changed. We're talking about deep and, and transformative change here to be able to come to live with what it is that we cannot change. Now, this is dependent upon feelings of frustration here turning into feelings of sadness. That is being able to feel the futility that is encountered. If frustration can turn into sadness, I think mad to sad in a toddler or tantrums to tears, if frustration can turn into feelings of futility, the work of adaptation can proceed. This is a brilliant plan, a brilliant plan. Uh, that is, the role of frustration is to effect change or to change us, to be changed, a brilliant plan. It sends shivers down my spine whenever I think of it again. However, if frustration fails in its work, it can neither effect satisfactory change and it doesn't turn into the sadness that can bring adaptation. This is where frustration turns foul. We might say it fails in, a, in its work. Frustration has become thwarted. It turns foul and seeks for release in some way or another. This is where it turns into impulses to attack, uh, and which seeks release, uh, some kind of release, some kind of, of venting, and it will, it will drive eruptions of attack in one way or another. That is, unless the capacity for mixed feelings has developed in the child. If the capacity for mixed feelings, that is, uh, that is, if impulses to attack immediately bring, on the other hand, but I don't want to, I don't want to get into trouble. I don't want to hurt my sister. I, 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 I don't, uh, I don't. Uh, 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 I don't believe in, in aggression or something like this, on the other hand, then it sends, it sends the traffic down uh, for another attempt at change or adaptation. But this takes time. There's a place in the brain reserved for it. We could call it the mixing bowl of the brain, the prefrontal cortex, uh, but it takes, it takes five to seven years for it to even get up and running. And then only if conditions are conducive. And so I experienced working with many adults who never actually developed this capacity. And so frustration led to impulses to attack. Now, the release of this, this, uh, these impulses, attacking impulses of foul frustration or fail frustration, we, we, or thwarted frustration, we may call it, can take many forms. And I've outlined those forms here. As you can see, there are many forms, sarcasm and insults, irritability and impatience, hitting and fighting, fits and tantrums, violent fantasies, even ignoring, shunning, and ostracizing. I won't take the time to go over all of them. You get the picture. The picture isn't pretty when frustration is frustrated or has been thwarted. Uh, you could say we're doubly frustrated, frustrated frustration. 
From tantruming toddlers to suicidal teens, from irritable parent syndrome to lashing out at loved ones. The most, or, or the form of attack here, it depends upon one's inherent nature, one's bent, so to speak, as well as the level of emotional maturity. And also the form of attack is influenced very much by who it is that the child is attached to. The key insight here, what is absolutely significant, significant when you see this you should read this that is when you see a manifest manifestation of foul frustration an eruption of attacking energy it should now occur to you that something isn't working for the child something isn't working for the for the student for the adult this insight is phenomenally transformative in guiding interaction to see the child as frustrated rather than as misbehaved, violating, and so on. So how exactly does the story of frustration turn into the story of attack? The story of frustration now you can see is, is or the story of attack is a substory of the story of frustration. And I will tell the story as simply as I can. There are three precursors that are part of every story of attack, regardless of its form, including how harmless or how violent it may be. The first, you will have guessed it, highly frustrated. Whether one is aware of it or not, something isn't working for the child or adult. Whatever it is, is certainly important to them. Secondly, futility is encountered, otherwise frustration would come to an end, but that futility is not felt. Sadness is missing. Or slow to sadness, we could speak, so highly frustrated, slow to sadness. Uh, and uh, Because if mad turned to sad, if sadness was felt, then it would proceed uh, to, to bring adaptation, deep transformation, to be able to, to deal with things that aren't working. You see, the brain has to feel its way through when it comes to the work of frustration. Now, once it turns foul and it turns into impulses to attack, now the only hope would be that these attacking impulses are, are tempered. As I said, the capacity for, on the other hand, feelings. And so this will lead to attack if attacking impulses are not untempered, at least at that time, it doesn't bring forth, on the other hand, I feel the impulse to attack, but I don't want to get into trouble, I don't want to hurt my loved ones, and so on. Simply put, what sets the stage for attacking impulses to erupt is being highly frustrated, slow to sadness, and lacking mixed feelings. The perfect emotional storm for frustration coming to attack. Now, we, these are the antecedents of aggression. The problem with eruptions of attack is we usually think we have to teach the child a lesson, and so we think consequences. Now, when, when you actually think consequences, will these add frustration? Absolutely. Are these encounters with futility? That's the whole point, but the child isn't feeling futility, so it's going to make matters worse. And this is what we have been doing because we have not understood the story of frustration. We've been making matters worse. Now, I'm going to take three quick walks around this traffic circle where attack is a typical outcome, each time looking through a different lens. First of all, the lens of attachment. Now, what is it that gets us frustrated the most? Well, attachment is our preeminent need. Togetherness are, is our preeminent need. So when we're facing thwarted proximity, we can't make contact, we can't make a connection, a loss, a separation. When we cannot do this, attachment's not working is the primary source of frustration. It just fills the traffic circle. It drives this whole thing. Uh, secondly, attachments are also a primary source of futility. We can control many things, but we can't control whether somebody likes us or wants to be with us or will hold on to us or even invite us into their existence. So attachment is a huge source of futility. And of course, sadness is a very tender emotion. Most of us only feel safe to feel sad when we're in the company of those that we're attached to when it's a safe relationship. Many children, many adults have no safe place to cry. 
And of course, if the eruptions of attack lead to further disconnections, uh, ascending to one's room, uh, uh, some way or another, a reaction that, I that increases the separation, breaks the connection, we have the makings of the perfect emotional storm, an escalating cycle. Unfortunately, this is what we've been doing because we haven't understood the story of frustration. So what are the implications here? Well, they're simple. That doesn't mean easy. It's simple. Look around, see what the where the child is facing separation. Reduce the separation being faced. And especially when eruptions occur, don't let these attacks disrupt the connection. Find a way of holding on. Find a way of coming alongside frustration. Find a way of getting into alongside that frustration. I see you're frustrated. That frustration needs to come out. Here, let me help you find a way. A completely different dance uh, can evolve. Well, let's look at the feeling factor. This is a huge factor. First of all, Frustration has to be felt to be managed. As I said, most of the work of frustration is unseen. It's invisible. We don't even feel the frustration uh, that is within us. It can surprise us, blindside us, or we don't feel it at all. We can't manage an emotion that we don't feel. Uh, secondly, remember that feelings are the eyes of frustration. And so frustration must be felt rather correctly for change to be effective. If it's just a general signal and the brain kind of fills it in with a cognitive backfill, oh, I think that that's the problem or this is the problem, we don't really feel it adequately, then the change won't be effective. Now, the futility encountered must be felt for frustration to end and adaptation to occur. Again, as I said, the brain needs to feel its way through. Feel its way through the maze of life. Adaptation is an emotional issue, not a cognitive issue. We need to actually feel the futility encountered, the keen disappointment, the sadness, uh, the grieving that is, is there. And, of course, we need to have our mixed feelings. The capacity needs to develop and we need to gather our mixed feelings. A lack of mixed feelings leaves attacking impulses untempered. And so these are, these are the, 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 the feelings that must be there. Now there is one more here. Feelings may be defensively inhibited if too vulnerable to bear. If, if they have become inhibited, this more systemic, and of course it creates the scenario uh, for attack uh, to occur. The, the uh, implication here is to provide safe sanctuary for feelings. Now what is a safe sanctuary for feelings? Well, we mentioned one which is safe relationships, a safe place to cry. Uh, if it's a safe place to cry, it will be a safe place for other feelings. What is the other safe sanctuary? Well, this brings us to the third quick walk around, the play factor. Play is a safe sanctuary for feelings. Uh, it, is, it, it is when we, when emotions are at play that can, they can be most, they can most be felt. Now, play is hugely important here uh, because before the child has developed the capacity for mixed feelings, uh, they need, uh, when they have impulses to attack, this needs to be taken into play. This is actually the first intervention. How can I take those impulses to attack when I say, let me help you find a way, it should be taking it to play. Playful attack, playful destruction play, all of these plays, well, they engage in other play to build their mixed feelings because prefrontal cortex now we know is built in play. In the meantime, we should do as much as possible to give them play that involves uh, problem solving and construction play, making things work. Because if they're playing at making things work, it, it heads it off at the past. Frustration will move into this kind of play. The feeling factor is huge. And last but not least, is it is much easier to access sadness in the play mode through stories, through music, uh, indirectly. It's very hard to access dire uh, directly. One step removed, and play can even make sadness feel sweet in drama and theater where it can be played. The implication here is we need to do our utmost to increase access to emotional playgrounds. We've been thinking that play is frivolous. In fact, it is the key to civilization according to the ancient Greeks. And I believe they were onto something. They made room for eruptions of 
of attack in their games. They joined frustration to sadness in their tragedies. They made mastery of music a must for their children to access sadness that could only be touched one step removed uh, in this music. Our challenge is to give play a chance to shoehorn our frustrated children into the society in which we live. We have thought it frivolous. It turns out to be the crucible of civilization for society at large and for each individual. And now to our last slide here. To create a story of frustration with good endings. This is our challenge. This is our challenge where frustration leads to change and ends in change. Where frustration, if we cannot effect change, leads to adaptation. These are the best endings. And if it needs to go into attack, at least not attack that violates, but attack that is safe from repercussions that doesn't make matters worse. Well, what is the answer? If there's a bottom line to this, what would be the answer? Is to, to create a story of frustration with good endings we need to cultivate a healthy relationship with frustration. Whether that be in ourselves, whether it be in our students, or whether it be in our children. Well, what does it mean to cultivate a healthy relationship? Well, first of all, it means that we accept that it exists. We may not agree with it, but we need to accept that it exists. It needs some space to work, uh, some space to relieve itself without doing harm if, if, uh, if it cannot lead to change or adaptation. You see, the ultimate uh, challenge for us as parents, as, as teachers, is to be traffic directors here, sitting in the middle, directing the traffic to where it most should come. And sometimes it's in directing it to playful, uh, playful attack. Uh, but we need to know the story of frustration. We need to know uh, the, the um, traffic circle of frustration. We need that kind of knowledge of frustration to be that kind of traffic director, nudging towards the outcome most appropriate uh, to the situation. Secondly, call it by name. Frustration, it's not that hard. Not anger, not, uh, not, uh, not violence, not aggressive, not being mean, not, uh, not all the other names that it can be called. Call it by name. I see you're frustrated. Reframe as needed. They may be calling it something else. Reframe it. Call it by name. That will allow you to focus on the frustration, which is key to being able to come alongside of it. You see, we can't help others if we can't come alongside of it. And how do we come alongside of them? By focusing on the frustration. We can always come alongside frustration. We can grant individuals that, that, that they can experience something not working. We can't make us, uh, everything work for a child, no matter how much we love them. So this is our way of coming alongside. You see, when we can come alongside the frustration, in ourselves even, in our loved ones, it unites us instead of divides us. Instead of fighting it, uh, we, can, we can help frustration do its work. And that's the thought I want to leave you with. I wish, I wish each and every one of you great insight and frustrate, and great insight and wisdom in helping frustration do its incredible work, because frustration needs our help, and we need to understand the work of frustration to be able to help it. Thank you.